Prairie View comes out victorious in a State Fair Classic that had a bizarro backwards type performance from Grambling and then Benedict College annihilates Fort Valley State to remain undefeated. Oh yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked on HBCU podcast, your number one. Dating one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked on podcast network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that it's time for the journey to be over. Just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives at the bottom of the screen. You can see it. And I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked on College Network. LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Locked On College. Terms and conditions do apply. And this State Fair Classic was kind of weird. It featured a very backwards and weird performance from Grambling. <laughs> so when I talk about Grambling, the key to victory was making second half adjustments. But they did exactly that and still lost. Now, the biggest adjustment was a change at quarterback, which we will talk about in the next segment. However, they had a better second half than first half for the first time all season. However, they just struggled so badly in the first half that it just didn't matter. Prairie View struggled to score points in the second half. Grambling got the offense going for a little bit. There was second half adjustments, which was the key to victory. All of these things you would think would point to a Grambling Tiger victory in Hugh Jackson's first State Fair Classic win, but it didn't. Prairie View put up no points offensively, right? They had a, a real late fluke type play, but we'll talk about that as well. And then Grambling put up 14 points and a half. That was the lowest amount of points that Grambling had given up all in the second half all season. Obviously, it was none. They had never done that. And then they scored 14 points, which was more than they scored all the time. The momentum for Grambling started and stopped with a special teams play. And that's what I referenced earlier when talking about how there were no offensive points scored by Prairie View, but there was one singular touchdown that the Panthers put on the board in the last 30 minutes. So how does this come to be, right? So Grambling scored a touchdown after the quarterback change, and then they ended up having a kickoff because, you know, obviously you have to kick off the ball. And then it they forced a fumble on that kickoff, scored another touchdown. Now they're going to get the ball back a little bit later. This is in the fourth quarter. Prairie View punts the ball. It's time for Grambling to get it back. It doinks off a Grambling player's head in a play that was just ridiculous to me. Bounced all the way to the end zone. Prairie View recovers it in the end zone. Scores the touchdown. It's the only points they score in the second half. But that was it. When they, when they recovered that fumble on the kickoff, it felt like Grambling could finally maybe come back. When they had that touchdown that went against them, wrap it up. It was done. You know, so they did all of these things in the first half, but they just did not have a great first half, which is completely backwards. They've had pretty much good first halves outside of the first blowout loss to Arkansas State. After, after that, they completely had good first half. They just didn't finish in the second. So it was very bizarre, very weird, and very backwards. Um... But let's get into all of the things that we looked at in Friday's episode. I'm talking about the three matchups and then also the key to victory, mostly because the only storyline that truly applied to Grant, well, I guess you could say it, it applied to Prairie View still, but both of the storylines applied to Grambling more than anything else. But let's get into it, right? So Sunday Ida Anderson did not register a snap. I mean, register a stat. I think it's easy to say that Prairie View won that matchup, right? He didn't register a snap, not a tackle for a loss. Um, not a sack, not even a singular tackle, no stats on the day for Sunday out of Anderson when looking at it. So I would say it's safe to say they won that. And then you look at Tariq Walmore versus the wide receivers of Grambling. Well, Grambling never really got their pass game going. They really struggled to get the offense going. 
So I think it's safe to say that Prairie View won that matchup. Now to the only matchup that's really even a conversation. The only one that can even be discussed, really. Right? Because if you want to be honest, you could say that Prairie View won those matchups. And I definitely feel like there's an argument for that. I think that's how you should phrase it. However, you could also say that it's just a no contest. Because, you know, it's like, okay, well, not the Sunday Yard Anderson one. He didn't register a snap. They won that. But then you could say more more. Well, they just couldn't get the offense going. Maybe that's not applicable. Fine, whatever. Still, that's two out of three. And in, in my game, in, in MMA, that's going to get you a win. You won two out of three rounds. You won this. And, oops, spoiler alert, um, Prairie View wins this this round. And that's Lewis Matthews versus Ahmad Antoine and then also uh, Trazon Conley. And Matthews had 17 tackles on the day. That's a pretty good output. There's no way to look at the stat sheet and say, oh, he didn't have a nice day. But if you want to talk about having a nice day versus making an impact on the game, I don't think his impact on the running game of Prairie View was that strong. You know, so when you look at it, Trazon Conley, he got loose for about 49 yards. You know, that's that's not terrible with the amount of times that he did run the ball. However, you still probably want less than that. And then the main eventer, we're talking about uh, Ahmad Antoine. He had 95 yards on the day. He had a, or 92 yards on the day, a long of 35 and a touchdown. That's that's not that's not winning the day on the ground. Um, I don't care if it's a long run and some more shorter runs mixed in. Um, even if you take out that 35 yard, he's averaging about four yards a carry. I think he might be a little under, and you're probably happy with a little under four. But that combined with a big gain, you're not happy with. So, though Lewis Matthews had 17 tackles, a tackle for a loss, half a sack, he had a pretty nice day. Antoine, or Ahmad Antoine, he wins the day. Then you look at, they also had Connor Wisham, who had 53 carries, or 53 yards on seven carries. So, if we really get into it, you can have all these tackles, all the tackles that you want. But if you're not stopping the run game for meaningful stops, Prairie View won that. They won all of them. And then let's get to the one matchup, right? Because, or not the one matchup, the one key to victory. And that was get pressure. They sacked Grambling four times on the game. But I want to get to a specific play. Right at halftime, Grambling had a really big kickoff return. It brought him to like the 30-yard line. And you want to get maybe a couple of more yards and let Urban get in comfortable field goal range. Didn't happen because Prairie View was able to heat up the quarterback. He ended up taking a sack, and now Grambling has to go into the halftime, not only scoreless, but without having an opportunity to put three on the board. That was a monumental play, and I think that stopped all momentum because you just had a nice kickoff return. It wasn't a touchdown, but it got you well into opponent's territory. You're supposed to capitalize and get points off of that. You didn't, and now you go to the halftime feeling extremely dejected. And there's another reason to feel dejected if you're a Grambling fan, and that's the fact that they keep playing hot potato with the quarterback position. You don't know who it's going to be. Is it going to be Julian Calvez? Or is it going to be Quaterius Hawkins? I'm going to tell you why it needs to be the former now, but first, before I do that, allow me to emblazon the screen with this beautiful graphic by uh, LinkedIn, right? Because LinkedIn jobs is perfect. If you're not a small business owner or somebody who's looking for a job, I don't know why you're not on here already. No more of the middle process of having to sit through hundreds of people when you know exactly what you need. You're looking at a resume and this guy doesn't fit. This girl doesn't fit. Man, if y'all don't go ahead and get with Jody, because Jody has everything that you possibly could want in an employee, he fits up perfectly. And that's the point of this. LinkedIn Jobs allows you to reach out to the people you want to talk to faster, get that done, create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs. Now, there's going to reach out to over 810 million people in nearly four. 40 million people every single week go to LinkedIn jobs trying to find something. So post your job for free for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college terms and conditions do apply. As we keep on rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day. And today's word of the day is emblazoned. And it means to decorate a surface with a name, slogan, or picture. We just emblazon this screen with the LinkedIn graphic. And I got one more for you as we keep rolling, right? But let's get into the fact that I think it's time for a quarterback change in Grambling, Louisiana. It's 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 time, okay? I'm tired of the hot potato. I'm tired of the back and forth. I'm tired of all of this. Let's go ahead and put Julian Calvez in and let's see what he has. Let's see what he's going to be. I cannot help but feel like this is not only what should happen, but what's going 
to happen. I can't help but feel that way, right? Because I'm not quite sure if anybody will comfortably sit in that spot for the rest of the year. I don't know if it's going to be one guy and it's just like, oh, this is Calvez's job for the next five games and we know that. Or if this is Hawkins' job for the next five games and we know that. I just don't feel that level of comfort when talking about this position. However, just to rewind, it's not as if this job was settled. It's not as if Hawkins was the man all summer. No, this was a job that was up in the air. I wasn't quite sure who was going to win this job until pretty much the end. And if that's the case, it's not much separation. And I don't think that you could, no matter who you feel, should be the quarterback. I think it's kind of hard to say that one of these guys has pulled ahead of the other, right? So I'm clamoring for Calvez, but that doesn't mean that I think that he's been so much better than Hawkins in the limited amount of time that he's played. And he's played nearly every single game. Right. We're going to get into his stats in every game. However, he's played quite a bit, he even thrown a decent amount of um, passes before this game came up. But overall, you're prone to some hot potato when it's a close race and neither guy separated. Now you're sitting in a spot where you keep going back and forth. Who is the guy? This is quarterbacks. We have to talk about the guy. You're not running two quarterback systems. Not right now. There are two quarterback systems, but that's not what you're running. You're running a one quarterback system that when one guy, Hawkins, has not lived up to what you wanted him to be in that game, you put in Calvez. Well, that's okay, but let's just go ahead and start Calvez, right? So I thought that Hawkins put together a really nice end of the Bethune-Cookman game when I was able to catch it. Obviously wasn't enough to withstand a bad game versus Prairie View. It happens. Okay, let's listen to what Calvez has done in the amount of action that he's seen. So he played in Arkansas State, the Arkansas State game, went one for 10, had six yards. That was a blowout. So I understand why he was in the game. It was an absolute blowout. Um, but that matters. Northwestern, they won the blowout. He went one for three, and he had negative three yards on the day. Jackson State, they also got blown out. They were losing the, the blowout. They, he went 0 for three in that game. Obviously no yards. And then today, or Saturday, I should say, um, prayer view game. He went five for 12, 82 yards. He played in multiple games. He hasn't looked great. You know, he went for one for 10 against Arkansas state, right? He's still trying to push up against, I think 25% is what he's looking at now. That's 10, 13, 16, 29. Ended up making seven. So he's right there around 25%. So it's not like he's looked great, but he's a freshman. And against Prairie View, it's been his best game, and it's the most recent game. But he keeps on getting in. And you know what? Hawkins is a junior, and I liked what I saw from Hawkins. Honestly, I can't say I liked it better than what I saw at the beginning of the third quarter, but I liked it. So with that being the case, it's still even. But I got two reasons that I think that this needs to have or needs to happen. Two reasons. One, What's been a quarterback really hasn't worked. And then two, you got to stop switching because it's going to start killing the confidence of your team, right? So number one, Hawkins, with them, they've only won one game with Hawkins. It is what it is. Um, you can feel a way about it. However, that's the truth. They haven't won many games with Hawkins. And honestly, they failed to have second half success on offense. The most offensive second half success they've had was against Prairie View. And who was playing? Julian Calvez. Now, when I say both sides or can't keep picking sides, switching sides, otherwise you're going to start killing confidence. If I'm in a locker room and I'm a wide receiver, how can I feel confident? They're not getting me the ball. How can I be like, oh, yeah, that's going to be the guy? How can I trust that he's going to put the ball on me when I need it to be? I just can't. Sitting here objectively, I can't do it. I'm not in that locker room. I'm not in practice with these guys. So they might have a different rapport. And, hey, I'm, I'm a Saints fan, right? And one of our wide receivers was talking about how he was happy about the quarterback change for this specific week because Jameis throws the ball a little bit harder than Andy Dalton does. And with it being cold, they don't want that, right? You want a little bit softer of a ball because it's easier to catch because the ball is naturally harder, right? So you have different rapports with these guys. However, overall, I just can't sit here and be happy with this. This isn't, this isn't satisfactory. You got to change something up. You got to change something up and hopefully you can build some sort of trust level. But all I know is that you've been blown out three times 
And that's why he had to come in. Calvis had to come in. And then the last time that he came in reserve duty, he actually looked better than he had before. Why not just go ahead and start him? It ain't like you a, you're a, above switching quarterbacks, so you can put Hawkins right back in. But let's go ahead and get Julian Calvez a chance as the starting quarterback next week. That's what I'm going for. That's what I think should happen. L definitely let me know what you, what you think. Grambling fans will definitely get vocal in the comments, all right? Those are, Grambling and Jackson State, those are probably the two most vocal people in the comments section. So please do not disappoint me now that I've said this. Let me know who you think the quarterback should be for Grambling going into next week. However, one team that is remaining undefeated is Benedict College, and they look absolutely dominant in their victory over Fort Valley State. I will tell you about that, but first, let's emblaze in the screen again. Bet online, bet online, bet online. Look at the bottom if you're on YouTube. You can find the, all the latest odds, news, and scores on bet online, but emphasis on that news. You can find the news on Bet Online that's going to allow you to make the best bets. These Sundays have been hard for me. I ain't been able to celebrate since week one. And we ain't really covering spreads either. It's tough. But we went through a really nice action or, or a day of action on Sunday. They've had really good games. And it's even better when you make some money off of it. So go make some money on Bet Online. But it's not just football. You also have basketball that's coming up. Preseason is here. You also have combat sports. You have golf. You have esports. You have everything on Bet Online. They're the most versatile, in addition to being the fastest and easiest. Way to wage on all of your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you guys. Shout out to my segment, Three Folks, and we're here to switch games, right? We're switching gears like LeVar Ball. And I want to talk about Benedict College because they absolutely decimated, annihilated. Um, I don't know, that would have been a little too far. But they have dominated <laughs> Fort Valley State thoroughly on Saturday. Um, if you're a team's homecoming opponent, you should take that personal and not in the Michael Jordan. I take everything personal type of way. I mean, like a regular person who doesn't need to self-motivate. If they schedule you as their homecoming game, you should be disrespected and you should go out there and perform like you were disrespected. And that approach is exactly what I saw from Benedict College. Y'all schedule me for your homecoming? Go schedule a Rudy Poo. Homecoming is for Rudy Poos. I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing worse than losing your homecoming. I seen it. I seen it when we thought at TSU we was going to smash somebody and then we ended up not. Oh, that was disappointing. It was the worst thing in the world. And then the following year, they said, you know what? We're going to go schedule this, this North American University. Oh, smash them, wipe the floor with them. It was a great homecoming, my first homecoming as an alum. It was phenomenal, right? But before it was like Missouri S&T. We all thought we was going to win. They came out and beat us on homecoming. It feels terrible. Nobody wants to lose on homecoming. But I also don't want to be your homecoming opponent. That's disrespectful to me. This was a battle of undefeated teams, but you wouldn't be able to tell it. If I told you that Fort Valley was an undefeated ball club and Benedict was as well, you tell me I was lying. Could it look like one undefeated team and one team looking for their first victory? That's the gap on Saturday. I'm not saying every single game, but on Saturday, that was the gap between Fort Valley and Benedict College, with Benedict obviously being the better team because it just never was close. Like, it just never felt close. That was an explosive third quarter. They scored 20 points in that third quarter to really put it out of reach permanently. But even before that, it just didn't feel like this was going to be a game. Benedict came out, scored on their first three. Nah, I'm a defensive guy. Let me start off with the defensive side of things, right? Fort Valley had five first downs on an early touchdown drive. It was their only touchdown for a long time. They had five first downs on that drive. For the rest of the game till basically the end of the third quarter, they only had five first downs. It was that point. They had three drives. Fort Valley had three drives where they actually got a first down on the drive. Three drives. Now, when they got first downs, they did get a little bit of movement. Two of those drives led to touchdowns. Um, one of those drives ended up ending in a fumble. And speaking of fumble, you had three drives that you got first downs in. You had three drives that ended in turnovers. That is a terrible offensive performance. You had 207 yards on the day. Your season low. This Benedict College defense that was looking phenomenal when you look at the rankings. 
You put it on the field and they absolutely eviscerated. I'm trying to think of, I don't know if there's any more ways I can say dominated and, and, and just smashed. They smashed them. Just be honest. Um, word to Khabib Nurmagomedov. They smashed Fort Valley, right? This was a great game if you're a Benedict College fan. If you're a BC guy or gal, this is, this is your, this was a game where you said this was a statement. This was a statement because nobody's going to say that Fort Valley hasn't looked good. It's not early enough in the season to say, oh, Fort Valley just isn't this. No, Fort Valley looks really good to start the year. Now we see what happens when they ran into a juggernaut, right? But there's no there's no complete defensive domination without a touchdown. And you end up having a 54-yard uh, fumble return. That was uh, in that third quarter, I believe. So overall, they were just absolutely de dominant. And then on the offensive side, you had Eric Phoenix, who did it with his arm and his leg. He was obviously the leading passer of the day, even though he had an early break. He said, you know, I'm done. Um he still was the leading passer, obviously. And then he was also the leading rusher of the day. So he did it on both sides, and he added two touchdowns as well. I almost gave Zaire Scotland that MVP, that Southern Stud Award. I almost gave him that. But the, and the reason I almost did, because he had four touchdowns on the day. He had three touchdowns on the ground, and he also had one touchdown receiving. So I was like, mm, four touchdowns. Oh, that might get him the Southern Stud Award. But I ended up, uh, ended up deciding not to do it. Because I just felt like Eric Phoenix was too dominant. He was efficient. Anything they wanted, they were going to get. Um, leading rusher against the leading rush defense in the conference. Overall, this was just a great victory for BC. And he was the engine. So Coach said this. And he said, we knew they were the number one in the league in rush defense. And we took that as a challenge. And we found a way to run the ball. 299 yards. They ain't never let up that many yards this year. They were averaging about 80 yards allowed. This is a dominant defensive unit that looked regular, schmegular. They looked like Rudy Poos when Benedict Collins was on the field. I thought Emmanuel Wilson for Fort Valley did have a good game. He had 100 yards on the day, but it wasn't much of an impact. He only scored two times. Um, to go out there, dominate a team, and then say, I'm going to beat you at what you're great at, even though that's not our greatest attribute. But what you're great out, what you're great at is stopping the run. Well, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna run it down your throat. And I did it and I dominated you on your homecoming. So allow this to be a PSA to everybody. Schedule Rudy Poos for your homecoming. Scheduling a competitive opponent, it ain't it. It ain't it. Nothing worse than, than losing on your homecoming. Hopefully you already got some drinks in your system and you're ready to keep out there and going partying. But if not, you better get them in your system. <laughs> uh, but yeah, drink responsibly. Drink responsibly. But more of the story, do not schedule good opponents for your homecoming. I'm glad that you got this message from me, Darian Gray, the mouth of the South. I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day. And on tomorrow's episode, we're going to talk about probably the upset of the week. And that's Lane College knocking off Tennessee State. Now, for your second listen, make sure you're checking out our conference shows. Make sure you're checking out Locked on Saints. It's hard, but Ross did a great job in the postcast, even though it's hard for us, all right? I got some grambling people here. Let's see. Y'all Saints fans out there? Uh, anyway, I'm going to leave that one alone. In the meantime, in between time, if you're looking for me, you can find me on Twitter, at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care. Stay blessed. Peace.